Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiator, and so I'm gonna try and keep this brief, but you guys who watch this channel know that I'm not always able to do that, but I really am this time. Um, and the reason for that is quite simply because this could be an enormous topic that you can make a whole series of videos about, and I don't want to get too bogged down. I have noticed recently that a number of people who concentrate on the use of long swords, okay, medieval long sword, well, medieval Renaissance long sword, um, have a tendency, and obviously I've known this for a long time, um, I've been involved in this world for nearly 20 years, um, but people who deal with medieval sources specifically, not just longsword actually, you see the same with, um, with sword and buckler and all sorts of other medieval systems, um, can become incredibly entrenched in their beliefs um, and uh, to, to a, an almost extremist, almost religious degree about what is right and wrong to do uh, with um, uh, ways of using medieval weapons. And um, I have noticed that one of the things that has been talked about recently, and some people like the way that they talk about this online, it, like dumbfounds me, um, they're talking about the way of cutting. Now, cutting is something that's always been popular for particularly people with doing longsword. Um, uh, I don't know why that is, particularly for longsword, but people who are doing longsword take um, cutting practice and cutting form very seriously. If we're honest about this, it's probably a little bit of a hangover and a little bit of an influence from Japanese martial arts. People doing sabre or backsword or langmesser or uh, rapier or side sword or um, sword and buckler tend not to be quite so uh, fixated on, on cutting. But anyway, I'm not saying at all that cutting is bad. Cutting is good and I love cutting, okay? Um, so do it, do it lots. But I have noticed there's an almost, um, well, like I say, an, an extremist <laughs> level of evangelical um, kind of uh, ranting about how you must and mustn't cut. Now, um, as someone who now focuses, who used to focus on, um, on medieval sources, primarily Fiore and Vardy, so Italian longsword, 15th century, um, but as someone who now focuses on 19th century military sabre, I maybe come at this from a different perspective because I do teach longsword regularly, I do cut with longswords, I have done tons of longsword, I've competed in longsword, I've done loads of stuff with longsword in the past, but in the last five or more years, I've focused on sabre. Now, in military sabre systems, you cannot say there is a right and a wrong way of cutting, okay? Um, quite simply because there are many different ways of cutting. The only requisite, really, to cutting is that you cut, okay? Now, in terms of is the cut the most powerful cut you can physically do? Often the answer is no. If we look at John Musgrave Waite's treaties, for example, he very clearly cuts from the wrist and talks about making a small movement. And he's explicit to state that's not because it makes the most powerful cut, because that's going to chop the most um, tatami mat, but quite simply because he is his priority is hitting the target and not being hit. That is making a cut that is as fast and as direct as a thrust. That is one of the key uh, underlying principles of John Musgrave Waite's entire system. And bear in mind that at the time um, that he was regarded as pretty much the foremost sabre, military sabre instructor in the entire country. And even after he was dead, people were still saying, yeah, if you want to learn about sabre, read Waite's book. Despite the fact that people like Hutton and Burton and, and various other people were uh, alive at that time, they said basically go and look at Waite. Okay, he was rated as the best. So, uh, how did he cut? He cut from the wrist. We know that other sabre systems from elsewhere in Europe sometimes cut with the entire arm. Okay, they brought the whole arm back and used all the joints of the arm and used a full body motion. Some other systems, for example in Italy, um, some Italians cut with the wrist. Some Italians, uh, in fact particularly uh, sort of Rodelli and the, the later Italian stuff, cut from the elbow. Okay, So therefore, uh, uh, even more than that, if we go over to Germany for example and we look at uh, Christmann, we can see that Christmann cuts by lifting the hand up as we see in, um, in Menschefechten. And so we can see almost like a Scheitelhau in Longsword, and I'll mention Scheitelhau again in a second. Okay, So we can see an entire different way of cutting. Weight cuts from the wrist but with the hand low or at shoulder height uh, the Germans seem to lift the hand up, at least no, I won't say all the Germans, but um, Christman and um, a few of the other um, treatises and we see this sometimes outside of uh, Germany as well. 
So there wasn't only one way of cutting with the military sabre or palash or spadroon or backsword. There were many different ways, okay? Even if we come through to how do you generate power, if we look at Zachary Wilde, 1711, he does what I call a snap cut, okay? Where it's almost like a punch and just drop the blade down. Whereas uh, if we look at um, Burton, for example, Burton, like many people, cuts with a moulinet, that is a circular motion, completely different way of arriving at the target. So there are many, many different ways of cutting just in the 19th century and 18th century, just with backswords and sabres. So why would we say that there's only one way of cutting with a medieval longsword? This makes no sense whatsoever. And people go, oh, if you read, you know, if you read the early Lichtenauer um, uh, verses and um, you read the early Lichtenauer related sources, um, then you see that it gives you a very clear way of cutting. And it's like, well, yeah, but then if you look at Maya, we see maybe some different things going on. If you look at Fiore, you see maybe some different things going on. And one of the things that's kind of got my goat recently is the number of people who have internally created a religion of the longsword for themselves, whereby push-pull of the grip is wrong. This is wrong, okay? Doing this where, where the hands uh, push and pull like this rather than uh, moving, the, I can't do it in here because of the space, moving the arms as Mike Edelson would uh, have us do with cutting, which I'm not saying is wrong at all, but say, saying that one is wrong and one is right. This is complete bullshit, okay? It's complete and utter bullshit. Why do you think that a weapon that was in use for about, what, two, three hundred years, okay, across all of the continent of Europe, would only have one correct way of cutting it. And also, as I said, as I promised, I mentioned the Scheitelhau, okay? With the Scheitelhau, yes, it's a specific cut for a specific ta tactical purpose uh, and reason, but it, it has a completely different body mechanic of cutting with it, just to say, as, the same way as you could say the Krumpau does as well. But the Scheitelhau is very clear to see that you lift the hands up a bit like what we see later in Christman with the way that the sabre was used. So there isn't only one way to cut. You can't say that push-pull is wrong and that, uh, or even another way to grip. You can't say that you must only put the hands between the, the quillons and the pommel. You must not grip the pommel. Sorry, there is loads of pommel gripping shown in the medieval Renaissance treatises. So as promised, I'm going to wrap it up there and keep it short. As you can see, we've talked about grips. We've talked about different sources, different periods. Although I'm primarily talking about longsword here, you could get into talking about how you cut with the arming sword, how you cut with the langmesa, is you know the different ways of cutting, the kind of rising hand snap cuts, or the sinking the hand draw cuts, push cuts, pull cuts, um, all sorts of where, moving the wrist or more, or moving the elbow more, or moving the entire shoulder more, how you move the hips, how you move the shoulders. Not all systems are the same. Okay, in fact, all systems are different. If a system's different, then it's a different system. And it ha might have some similarities with another system, and it might have a huge number of differences. It might only have a few differences. But the fact is, please, this is a plea to the HEMA community, stop saying that something is wrong and something is right. If it cuts, you can't say it's wrong. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. We've got extra videos on Patreon, t-shirts on Spreadshirt, and I hope to see you for the next video.